Seen up close, and even very, very close, nature takes on a whole other dimension. Our eyes delight in the finesse of a branch. We marvel at the delicate nature of a flower. Beneath trees, we are prone to dream. If we could look much closer and plunge into the intimacy of plant life, we would discover a disturbing yet stunning complexity. This green chaos, covered with what looks like the eyes of snails, is in reality the surface of the leaf of an ordinary tree, enlarged hundreds of times through digital 3D microscopes. Today, scientific imagery enables us to see plants like never before, and we find, in awe, that the world of plants remains largely a mystery to us. Humans have several common points with plants. They have a vascular system, similar to our veins and arteries, which ensures fluid circulation. Plants have an electric network, resembling our nerves, through which information travels. Plants secrete hormones, and other points of similarity could be revealed. On the other hand, without a heart or brain, absolutely essential for us, plants throughout their evolution have developed some extremely original solutions for survival, solutions we could learn from. Stefano Mancuso, a professor at the University of Florence in Italy, founded over 10 years ago the first international laboratory of vegetal neurobiology, which studies the interactions between plants and their environment. Plants are able to sense the environment in an exquisite way. They are much more sensitive than animals, and they need to be uh, more sensitive because they cannot run away from the danger. Plants are rooted to the ground. This forced sedentary nature has steered their sensorial organization to become accurate and highly efficient. Sensitivity is not something that is linked to a brain. The brain in itself, it's a stupid organ. It's just an, a, an amount of cells that we have here and every animal have. There is nothing mysterious or supernatural uh, about the cells of our, of our brains. They are just a kind, a specific kind of cells called neurons. But you don't need neurons to make this stuff. You can have all other kind of cells having the same function. So it means transmitting signals from one cell to the other. Humans must react instantly to their environment, especially when confronted with danger. Transmission of nerve impulses spread throughout our nervous system at a speed of 100 meters a second. Do plants need such rapid connections? To calculate the speed of electric signals in a plant, Bruno Mulia and his team from the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and the Environment, INRAI, is placing electrodes on the stem of a shrub. The flexion here has triggered an electric current which spreads throughout the plant, but weakens at roughly 20 centimeters. When the plant receives a gust of wind or an insect bite, there are two signals that spread throughout the plant, an electric signal over some dozens of centimeters and a hydraulic signal that can even travel to the roots. The conduction speed of the electric impulse, seen in this image highly accelerated, is only six to eight centimeters per minute. This slower conduction speed is logical with the sedentary life of plants. To create the organic matter required for growth, a plant needs light provided by the sun, carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere, and water. Light is absorbed through chlorophyll, the tiny round globes contained in plant cells. Thanks to chlorophyll, light, water and carbon dioxide are transformed into sugars, 
which the plant feeds on. This process, known as photosynthesis, releases oxygen into the Earth's atmosphere and provides all the organic matter and the energy necessary for life on Earth. The procedure seems simple, but in everyday life, plants are regularly confronted with vital problems. Water is capricious, and plants don't want too much or too little, and it must fall at the right time. Roots seize the water in the soil through a large number of little hairs. Under lack of water, roots are the first to perceive the threat and action the close of the stomata. Stomata are little mouth-like pores spread over the leaves. It is through these that the plant breathes and releases the water vapor produced by photosynthesis. When roots send the signal, lack of water, the stomata pores shrink. The plant captures less carbon dioxide and reduces growth. Daniel Shamovitz, a botanical genetics scientist, discovered a gene in the hairs of plants that is similar to those responsible for the vibrating hairs in the inner ear of humans. From a genetic point of view, plants have the same genes that are needed for hearing that animals have. This gene in animals is a gene which enables the hairs of our inner ears to be formed, and these are the hairs that vibrate in sound waves. These are genes that are needed for us to hear. Plants have essentially the same genes, which might lead us to think that plants hear the same way. But when we look more in depth of what these genes do, they're necessary for forming of hairs at the tips of roots. But these hairs apparently are not listening, but they're necessary for the roots to absorb water. So while the genes cause the same structures to be formed, hairs, in humans it's needed for hearing, and in plants it's needed for drinking. This unexpected proximity fascinates and drives Stefano Moncuso. We are um, quite sure that plants are able to use the information coming from the sounds in the soil, for example, to detect the quality of the soils, the amount of water in the soils, the presence of obstacles in the soil. So they are uh, in, in some way using uh, uh, information coming from uh, sounds for, to have an idea of the space around them. So just put a, a loudspeaker close to these roots and you will see that if the frequencies are in the range between 100 to 1000 hertz, the roots will turn toward the source of the frequency. If the frequencies are uh, higher than 5,000, the roots will grow against the source of the, of the sound. The plant Desmodium gyrans was once thought to dance to music. Today's fact, it moves its leaves towards the zone that gets the most light. Some may say that plants do better and grow quicker when their favorite music is played. What is important for plants are, is not the music, but are the frequencies. We found that there are a range of frequencies in the, in the, low, in the low part of the spectrum. Between 100 and 1000 Hertz, there are many frequencies that we could say uh, plants like. They are completely uh, insensitive to the, the quality of this classical rock, blues, and so on, of the music. But they are able to uh, detect specific frequencies and to react to these frequencies accordingly. If there is one sound which humans find disturbing, it's the whining of a mosquito in the dark. 
Could plants be aware of the buzzing of insects? In Israel and in the global scientific community, the work of Lilac Hadney is making a buzz. Her research backs up the idea that plants identify the sounds made by pollinators and take advantage of this. Flowers produce nectar with the sole aim of attracting pollinators that feed on the sugars it contains. By harvesting the nectar, pollinators bring pollen from other flowers and this pollen fertilizes the flower they visit. Researcher at the University of Tel Aviv, she has recorded the buzzing of bees as they sip nectar. She plays back the buzz through a loudspeaker held above a flower bed of primroses. Lilac and one of her teammates then harvest the nectar secreted by the flowers and measure sugar levels with an analyzer. Much sweeter nectar this time. It's estimated up to 30% of the uh, energy of the plant is wasted on nectar. So to keep nectar high in all time is a very expensive process and also that attracts all sorts of uh, robbers, bacteria, fungi, birds. If you can have nectar low when pollinators are not around and increasing sugar concentration only in times where pollinators are around, that could save the plant a lot of energy. While the forms and shapes of flowers are diverse, many are concave, shaped like a bowl or a bell. If we look at this flower, uh, it has this uh, bowl shape, a bit like a small uh, satellite dish. So we suggest that the flower is the external ear of the plant. An ear that has evolved to respond specifically to the sounds of the pollinators of this very plant, bees or moss. This flower vibrates in response to the sound of bees, but if we remove some of the petals, this remaining petal would not be able to respond so much to the sounds. Lilac picks a few primroses to take back to her laboratory. She wants to check if the petals are receiving the sound of bee flight. She observes them under a high-resolution optical microscope. When she plays the recordings of bees buzzing, along with other pollinators, a laser beam measures the vibration of the petals to establish a scale of the flower's reactions. With the laser vibrometer, we were able to detect tiny vibrations in response to sound. And we saw that indeed, the flower vibrates in response to bee sound, but not in response to much higher sounds like bed sounds. Sounds made by other animals bring no reaction from the flower. But the buzzing of a bee leads the flower to produce a sweeter nectar. If plants hear, if plants sense sound waves, they do it in a completely different way. They didn't say, oh, what should we listen to today? But it did develop the ability to respond to the sound of a pollinator, and then to differentiate between a pollinator and a non-pollinator. And that makes sense also, because if you're responding to every wavelength, 
then you're just, um, you're, you're wasting energy in making nectar for someone who will never drink it. We are still thinking of the uh, possibility of plant communication after hearing the bee sound. For example, within the same bush of the evening primrose, there is one flower exposed directly to the bee. But is the signal transmitted to other flowers on the same plant? This is something we intend to study. 